Hey folks, Rob Ager here with another Stanley Kubrick film analysis update. Uh, this one is about The Shining and The River of Blood. I did a video on this many years ago talking about uh, an object which appears to be in the uh, River of Blood scene. Uh, something seems to flop out of the elevator and you see it there on the floor. Now when I first posted about this uh, way back and I think it was something about 2009, 2010, something like that. Um, long time ago I posted this and I didn't give a definitive interpretation of this detail at the time. Um, and I still don't have a definitive interpretation but it's worth doing an update for a handful of little reasons. Uh, the main reason being that the scene has been recreated in CGI in the movie Ready Player One. Uh, and that's going to be quite important to this update. It's crucial to this update, really. Uh, but first of all, let, let me just sort of go over it very briefly. Now, I'm going to be putting things on screen here and looking at them as I'm talking to you, because this isn't really a, a planned or scripted presentation. So I'm going to be looking at things here uh, on screen, and I will edit them, them into the video so that you can see exactly what I'm talking about. Okay, now, uh, but before we start, there's something quite important is that when I edited the original video, I was just using the DVD, which wasn't high definition, you know, wasn't HD, low resolution. Um, and so it was a little bit blurry. But as far as I was concerned, even in the DVD version, once you noticed it, it was pretty clear that there was an object that falls out of this door into the river of blood. And you may think, so what? Well, it could be just so what? But let's find out. I mean, let's do some exploration. Uh, because there are some specific symbolic things that could be going on with this footage. I'm not sure about it, but I want you guys to explore it anyway and give me y y your ideas about it. I'll give you some of mine later in the video, uh, but I also want to hear yours. Okay, so I'm just looking at the footage now. You see a flow, and right there, just before the blood splashes up from the sides of the image uh, to block out the view, we get this. It looks like um, a skull or a, a, I don't know, maybe a dead body or some other object maybe that falls out of the elevator with the blood. Okay, so, and then all the blood splashes over and obscures it and it's gone. And we see this river of blood many times. Oh my God, there's the twins. I don't like seeing the twins. Nobody likes seeing the twins. So yeah, um, this river of blood is shown multiple times in the movie and, <laughs> funnily enough, associated to the film's title, this object <laughs> in the river of blood literally shines. What the hell is that? Okay, now I'm showing it to you in HD uh, and it's more clear that there is something there in the river of blood, but even in the old DVD versions, that was clear as well. Now, when I first posted this, um, about this, uh, where it was only a short video, about seven or eight minutes long, years and years back, um, I, th there was a lot of responses, um, a lot of people arguing that it was, um, that it was just an object that was used to um, control the flow of the fake blood out of the elevator to get it to flow the way Kubrick wanted it. And yes, that is absolutely a possibility. Uh, I haven't discounted it. Uh, there were other people who were saying, there's nothing there, there's, there's no object in the River of Blood, which absolutely amazed me. Because, if you go and look at this, you get a nice smooth flow as the, the blood falls, but then once it hits the ground, the vast majority of the blood turns into these very fine splashes, um, you know, virtually pixel-sized droplets falling about and you can see that and there is clearly something there's a very specific highlight that holds for something about like under four seconds or something like that that's a there is one two three yeah about three seconds it very specifically holds it's not just one highlight there's a few highlights there in fact it almost looks like there's a a tube or an object or something that is making the blood flow to the right. It looks like there's some sort of a, a cable or a, an object that is coming out of the elevator near the top 
and towards where we see the highlighted part at the bottom. And it looks like that is causing the blood to flow outwards to the right, which is weird. Now, this, I do know from the Kubrick archives talking to the staff there that this, um, this shot was filmed and I think they said it was four times the speed um, that it would have been. So basically what we see in the movie is this splash coming out at a quarter of the speed of what it was filmed because this was a miniature set and I think there were around about 10 or 12 takes done and every time they had to redo this fake set make it all pristine clean and white and then Kubrick would say oh yeah that's not good enough and he'd want something else changing so they had to do this repeatedly and it went on every couple of weeks they'd redo it that's from the the, the biographies on Kubrick that I've read and uh, so yeah this was shot many times and from what I can tell it looks like there's probably been some jets at the sides, uh, at the side alcoves where the blood splashes up because when the blood goes across the floor to the right and it hits the, the, the right alcove, it shouldn't splash up as high as it does, but watch how high it splashes. See, and, and there's too much blood splashing up as well. So I think what's happened there is there's been some... Uh, jets have been arranged some tubes or something that have been timed to splash the blood upwards to, to throw up blood from the left and right in a, a sort of symmetrical fashion because being that the blood is splashing out from the left it shouldn't splash equally up from both sides but it pretty much does so I think the jets have been timed to splash up extra blood from the sides to get that sort of um, symmetrical splashing across Let's have a look again. It's not totally symmetrical, but it goes to the same height. Now, after I posted the original video, uh, there was a guy, I think he, what did he call himself? Dave Ridlin. Uh, yeah, Dave Ridlin. He posted a video that claimed to debunk the idea that there was something in the River of Blood. And in the original comment section on the video, from what I could recall, at least half of the people commenting agreed that there was something there in the River of Blood. A lot of people thought that it meant nothing and that it was just a device to um, control the flow of the blood. And I agree that could be the case. But Dave Ridlin was saying that there's nothing in the River of Blood and that this is just a reflection of the door and the walls that appears at the bottom there which I completely disagree with. And I've got some new evidence to back that up as well. Now what Dave Ridlin did was he created a CGI reenactment of the River of Blood. Apparently he was some CGI special effects expert. Uh, not that that means he's right. I mean, I'm an ex-graphic designer myself. I've got a very good uh, visual eye. I can draw and paint things very accurately. Um, I can draw and paint water to look realistic, so um, I'm not stupid on that front. In Dave's video, he created a CGI reenactment. Uh, he, cl uh, he claimed that it was shot at six, about six times slower than normal speed, um, but you know, we can forgive him for making a, mis a slight mistake on that. Uh, the folks at the Kubrick Archive said to me it was four times slower than normal not six but that's uh doesn't really make much difference so dave showed in his video he said here's some examples of miniature water at different frame rates and he showed that and yeah that's fine but as you can see in his own examples nothing gives the impression that there is any kind of object hidden that falls out with the water there are no um, highlights that remain in place to make it look like there's an object. It just looks like splashing water like we would expect the River of Blood to look but it doesn't. Okay so he goes on and he talks about saying that it's all just um, reflections. Okay so here we go we have uh, Dave Ridland's CGI, CGI reenactment 
of the scene and he's put a lot of effort into this you know well done to him but as we can see here from his own side by side examples and in the running footage his CGI blood is like treacle it doesn't flow like uh, actual liquid does uh, the footage in the original shot it has the very fine speckles of water splashing around and Dave Ridland's reenactment doesn't have that it's all splodgy and gooey it looks like jelly uh, it looks like treacle it looks thicker than treacle actually and I think what he's done there and I'm going to be honest about this I think he's been deliberately deceptive on this he's created a intentionally thick as treacle version of the blood so that he can try and get the highlights that he wants to be there to make it look like uh, there was just reflections in the the blood um, rather than actual object and you can you can very clearly see the difference he's created a very smooth section there to try and get the highlights that he wants to be there but when you look at the original footage it's not smooth like that there's a very specific group of highlights and everything around it is all splashing about in fine particles and Dave's version intentionally removes the details of the splashing to make everything look very smoothly reflective it almost looks like chocolate <laughs> I was never ever convinced by this CGI uh, rendition and I, I did have long conversations with Dave about this and he was just not open to the idea at all that there might be an object that he was totally determined that there has to be reflections and nothing else okay so what I've just given you there is a, a rough breakdown of the um, the original video that I had uh, minus any symbolic interpretations uh, and Dave Ridland's footage but if you go to the movie Ready Player One which came out uh, was it 2018 and whether you like the movie or not I mean there was parts of it I like there's parts I don't like uh, I've actually only watched it properly once and I found it interesting but I haven't gone back to it yet maybe I wouldn't like it on a second view I don't know but the shining reenactment scenes in Ready Player One are really interesting and they redid the river of blood but this was a proper um a hollywood quality high expense you know big budget movie reenactment of the river of blood scene and the quality of the the blood reenactment is way way better than it is in the dave ridland footage now i'm not saying that that means dave is a, a very bad cgi artist i mean he probably didn't spend much time doing that but this one is more professionally done and it's more accurate to the original footage for the most part so let's take a look at that okay so for those of you not familiar there's scenes in ready player one where some of the characters go to a cinema and they watch the shining and they end up going into the movie looking for clues towards some easter egg thing that they're looking at. I can't be bothered explaining the plot of Ready Player One. Um, but yeah, these characters actually go into the Shining movie. And here they are in the Colorado Lounge, looking around, looking for clues. And this guy goes running away and he finds the elevator scene. Only this time you've got the twin little girls are there. They say hello to him. He's not seen the movie and uh, he's asking them if they know a way out of the hotel or something like that they go into the elevator right now that didn't happen in the original film um, in the original movie the twins were not themselves directly associated with the elevator in any way that i can recall we don't see any shots of them going in and out of the elevator uh, but here we see them in ready player one going into the elevator now of course kubrick didn't make this film um, so that doesn't necessarily say anything about what the scene means. So the twins go in, and now you get the reenactment. Okay, there you go. He presses the buttons. Now watch this reenactment. Look at the quality of the blood here. It's got the tiny detailed splashes that are severely lacking in Dave Ridland's reenactment. Now it still looks a little bit treacly in places, but it's still very, very impressively done. 
However, if we look again, if we look for the object in the river of blood, it's missing. So that's a CGI reenactment Hollywood quality style that actually supports my position that in the original uh, footage there is an object in the river of blood. It's a ve very, very impressive uh, CGI recreation actually in the way they've expanded it going down all the halls and stuff. Now, what's, what's the point of all this? You know, I mean, oh, all right, so there's an object in the river of blood, so what? Big fucking deal. <laughs> okay, well, I mean, as I've talked about in many, many other videos before, there are lots and lots of things going on in Kubrick's films that are really interesting that suggest that there is more going on plot-wise, uh, or even that there are hidden ideas, hidden concepts, hidden themes worked into his movies. And I've been making videos about this for years, along with doing film analysis of lots and lots of other movies as well. Now, this River of Blood one, it could just be an object that is designed to make the blood flow out um, in the way that Kubrick wanted. That's cool. And if it is, that's fine. Uh, I can deal with that. Uh, however, I suspect that there might be more to it than that. I suspect that Kubrick might have wanted it to be there in order to communicate some particular concept. Why do I think that? Well, because the River of Blood elevator itself is specifically designed to look like a face. Uh, you can see the elevator dials right above it. They look very, very much like a pair of terrified, screaming eyes. Right? So you've got this big red elevator mouth right underneath it. And you might say, oh, come on, Rob. Yeah. Okay, well, I've got some very, very good evidence to support that concept. Uh, first of all, in the movie itself, the way it's edited, we see this um, elevator multiple times in the movie. And in several instances, I think it was two instances, maybe three, uh, this elevator is intercut with Danny's screaming face, with the eyes, the whites of the eyes showing, and his mouth wide open, his red mouth wide open. It's intercut with this shot in, I think it's three occasions in the movie. I'll, I'll put them all on screen for you to look at. Here they are. So I'm sure you can see there that <laughs> there, there appears to be some sort of cross symbolism between the elevator and the, uh, and the elevator dials and Danny's screaming face with the eyes. Uh, also, there's a point in the original Shining novel um, what, at the end of one of the chapters, the Jack Torrance character, he goes near an elevator. I think he's not long come out of room 237 or something like that. Or I can't remember. There's something he experiences which terrifies him. And he thinks about using the elevator. And he looks at the elevator and he says, actually, you know what? I'm going to dig out the novel now. I've got the novel in the other room. I've got it. I've got this note in the, in the novel. I'll dig it out and I'll read it out. But anyway, page 280. Uh, Jack Nicholson, he's just been through something that's happened in the hotel and he considers taking the elevator. So let me just read it. I didn't see that at all, Jack Torrance said quite clearly. His face was white and haggard and his mouth kept trying to grin. But he didn't take the elevator back down. It was too much like an open mouth, too much by half. He took the stairs. Okay, now the novel is not a reliable source for interpreting the film. Talked about this many times before, and I'm not the only one who's talked about it. The movie is so different to the novel, so many vast changes have been made uh, that the novel is no longer a reliable way of interpreting the film. However, the notion of an elevator as a face being in this novel. I think what's happened there is I think Kubrick's read this novel and he's been taking various notes and he's probably read that line and he said to himself, oh, you know what? I can do something with that. I can use that symbolically in the film. And I think he's actually done that. He's made the elevator like an open mouth with the screaming eyes. And I think he probably got that idea from the book there. Um, some other supporting information about this is that I've been to the Stanley Kubrick archives in London and I looked at the alternative poster design sketches by a, a very well-known artist of the time called Saul Bass. 
Uh, I've got a book of his work here. He's a really, really good artist. And uh, he did a, a mountain of uh, sketches, conceptual sketches for Shining posters for Kubrick. And they had a long back and forth chat. I looked at some of the letters that had gone back and forth between them that were there in the archives. And Kubrick was asking for more of this, less of that, blah, 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 blah. And one of the things that pops up again and again and again in the um, poster concept sketches for the film, which you know Kubrick was um, working on the concepts with Saul Bass, and Saul Bass was sketching them up, is that frequently there are architectural elements of the Overlook Hotel which are specifically rendered as faces in, in these alternative poster sketches. So you'll see like the Overlook Hotel from outside, and there will be some, it, it will be all dark, but there will be some lit windows and doorways uh, that form a skull uh, or some other kind of face. Um, there are other sketches showing hallways inside the hotel uh, with doorways like uh, faces, like very blatantly like faces. Um, and there are various shots of large um, mouths with human figures inside the mouths from what I recall, um, which is one of the reasons why I suspect that the object that falls out in the river of blood here may have been intended by Kubrick to be a dead body falling out the elevator. Okay, so um, yeah, there's lots of that in the Kubrick archives, and if you actually go look at the movie um, and pay close attention to the sets, one of the things that occurs in a few scenes is where you get these specific doorways, double doorways with windows, that kind of look like skulls. I'll show you a couple of examples here. Look at those. I mean, that one's flesh-coloured. And then you've got this one here with the shining eyes, like a shining eyes skull. And shining eyes is a very uh, prominent feature in the poster design sketches in the Kubrick archives as well. So, faces built into the architecture of the hotel subliminally is there in the Kubrick Archives sketches, and it appears to me that it's there in the movie. So, if this elevator uh, shot, if that's intended to be uh, a symbolic face, then obviously there's some meaning going on there. Why would you have that? You don't just throw that in for nothing. You could just say, oh, it's just there to creep people out. Um, <clears throat> but... What I suspect is that the object that falls out of the door is intended to be a dead body. And it's the body of um, Danny's imaginary friend, Tony. We never get to see his, his friend, Tony, in the film. He gets talked about at various points. Um, and he's described as being a, like a, a little finger. Danny uses his finger to talk uh, for the voice of Tony. And he describes Tony like this. No, he's a little bit lives in my mouth. Tony's his imaginary friend. Because he hides. Where does he go? To my stomach. And so if the elevator screaming face represents Danny's screaming face, which seems to be there in the way the film is edited, then if that's a dead body falling out the elevator, wouldn't it be his imaginary friend Tony who lives in his mouth coming out in the open uh, opening the door and letting all the blood out I'm not totally convinced on this by the way uh, I'm just there's a lot of things that connect quite well with that and I'm not I'm not sure it could be something else so that's just an interpretation a half-baked interpretation to run by you guys. And I did talk about that interpretation years ago. So again, I'm interested. What do you guys think of that? Is that something that you find... Uh, is that something you can expand on? Is that something that you can discredit? Do you have a better interpretation of this? Um, I don't know. I'm interested to hear you guys' thoughts. But also interesting and potentially tying in with that is uh, the fact that in the Ready Player One movie, we see the twins walk into the, the elevator. And I mean, the, the fact that uh, the Shining clips are recreated in the Ready Player One film, that would have to happen with the permission of um, the copyright owners of the original movie. I can't remember which production studio 
um, put Ready Player One together, but there would have to be some legal permissions to reenact uh, scenes from The Shining in Ready Player One. And I assume that uh, maybe the, the, the Kubrick estate, maybe their permission would probably be required for it as well. Um, and so if that kind of permission was given, um, and maybe even if uh, Spielberg and uh, the, the, his team on Ready Player One, if they had consulted with the, the Kubrick family uh, about doing these scenes, it's possible that there could have been some sort of conceptual collaboration effort. And as a result of that, um, it, it could have been that, oh, you know, let's have the twins go into the elevator. Um, but then once the river of blood flows in Ready Player One, you don't get the body fallout. So again, that's a half-baked idea. It's just, I'm just playing around with ideas here. Um, but one thing I, I also am very convinced of in the original film, and I, I talked about this in a lot of detail in uh, a video about the, the sim symbolism of the twins in The Shining, is that um, the twins sort of represent uh, Danny himself as a kind of split personality. The, the twins tend to be shown in mirrored compositions and uh, it's like they are a split uh, personality. Uh, and Danny himself, with his imaginary fr friend, is a, a split personality, you, you could say. Um, and with children who suffered trauma, they often externalize their trauma onto an object outside of themselves. It could be an imaginary friend, or it could be a cuddly toy that they've got, and it's like they will externalize all the trauma into that character and then try to comfort that character. You know, a, a, a little kid will protect their favorite cuddly toy, um, and that seems to be a way of dealing with the, the, their own traumatic emotions in life, is to take their most negative feelings, project them into the cuddly toy, and then offer personal protection to the cuddly toy. Uh, and as we grow older, we become good at doing this with ourselves. We learn how to dissociate ourselves from our own most negative um, and disempowered emotions. Uh, and then we sort of comfort ourselves. We, we develop a kind of split personality within ourselves where there's one side of us that feels all the intense pain and emotions of life. And the other side of us uh, tries to provide comfort and reassurance uh, to the vulnerable part of ourselves. <coughs> You could say we all have a split personality in that respect. And I think that's there in The Shining. Danny's definitely got it with his imaginary friend. And I think the twins represent that. Um, and so having the twins go into that, that elevator and then Tony fall out. I don't know. I'm playing around with ideas. So anyway, this has been a bit of a, a muddled presentation here. Because I haven't got this stuff all worked out. Uh, I am very convinced that there is an object in that river of blood. I don't know what it is, and I don't know what it symbolizes, but I've got various ideas which I've presented to you. So I'm interested to hear what you guys have got to say about this. Do you see an object in the river of blood? Do you think it's just reflections? Uh, if there's an object, what do you think it is? Why do you think it's there? Let me know, folks. And before I go, for those of you who enjoy these kinds of videos, which is not everyone, but for those of you who do, um, you can get much more of my content on my website, collativelearning.com. I've got a load of discount sales available up to 70% off on various downloadable uh, videos and articles uh, which are not available on YouTube or anywhere else online. So you can grab a load of those uh, while they're available. They are available until the 1st of November uh, and then they'll be gone and it could be six months before I have another big batch of sales on again so grab those while you can and there's plenty of other content available to my patreon supporters i think there's about 12 hours worth of material you, that you can access uh, by signing up to that uh, and also uh, which will be available very soon on my site it's in the editing stage at the moment um, is my latest analysis on john carpenter's the thing and the perception of disease which is a major uh, issue at the moment uh, because the thing movie can be looked at kind of differently in the light of everything that's happened in the last two years so that one's coming up on the site very soon as a sale only item but i've got various other things in the pipeline that will be available here on youtube as well i've definitely got um some alien isolation uh, analysis videos coming up i've got all my footage recorded for it i'm just in the process of chopping it up into the clips that i need which will take a while because it's a huge amount of footage 
but in the near future you'll be getting some detailed alien isolation uh, studies here on this channel. Um, I'll probably have some more Mirror's Edge for those of you who are into video games. And what else have I got working on at the moment? I've got tons of stuff. I tell you, I've got so many projects. Um, I never know which one's going to appeal to me next, but there's always going to be something. Right, you've been listening to Rob Ager of CollateofLearning.com. I hope you enjoyed this. Bye for now, folks.